Hello again, everyone, and thanks again for joining us for this Tuesday's edition of Alaska Weather. I'm Dave Percy, and I'll be hosting today's show. Up uh, first, uh, the fire weather graphic here, and we lost just about all the extreme fire danger we had on the yesterday, especially up here over the northwest, mostly due to uh, the uh, winds dropping off from what they were, and uh, also just high fire danger now in the Yukon Flats. And a little bit of uh, an area of extreme there over the Seward Peninsula. Uh, and that's about it. Uh, actually, this area down here, a little less than what I have shown. But uh, still on the high side there across the uh, northern part of the Yukon Delta. Otherwise, pretty good here around the remainder of the state. And uh, looking at satellite imagery today, had this uh, upper level low that came down out of the Arctic over a couple of days back. And has been tracking southwestward here and today is right over almost on top of Bethel this afternoon that triggered more thunderstorm activity here uh, mostly just to the east or along this uh, feature this cloud feature right through here with showers extending down in toward northeast Bristol Bay and uh, the Aleutian Range and we have uh, moisture sliding westward here associated with a easterly wave uh, coming across Copper River Basin and the western Copper River Basin like Eureka uh, during the day in 12 hour period and at 3 p.m. had about half an inch of precipitation uh, rain all day at Palmer with uh, or at least the observation showed rain the entire day with about a quarter of an inch falling there and that contrasts with about a hundredth of an inch at Anchorage and a system pushing in across uh, upper level low finally at least part of it it's uh, sort of split in half one section coming through currently over the southeast coast the other one hanging back off the coast and that uh, brought a significant amount of rain to some areas, uh, two-thirds of an inch down toward uh, the southern southeast coast there. And Haida had about four-tenths of an inch, or half an inch, as did Juneau, half an inch of rain. Heaviest amount, Sitka, three-quarters of an inch. But you can already tell here, becoming more showery there, especially along the coast. And uh, that's going to be the trend, is for less precipitation and over the, over the next few hours and definitely overnight tonight and through tomorrow, but it's going to take some time to end. Anyway, just uh, areas of showers, mostly cloudy skies here, as you can see, extending all the way down to the uh, coast there, Prince William Sound, but rainfall amounts on the light side as they were uh, elsewhere. Stony River picked up about uh, four-tenths of an inch of rain due to the thunderstorms today. But as you can see up to the north, sunshine, temperatures uh, 72 degrees this afternoon at mid-afternoon in Kotzebue, 75 in Bettles and Chalkitsik up to 76 uh, with sunshine all the way out to the Arctic coast, uh, almost to the Arctic coast, reporting some clouds there, actually some fog early on. You just see the uh, remnants of the fog bank there right along and off the coast. Otherwise, a very nice day, clear skies out to the west. Down in towards St. Lawrence Island again, Chuck CC, starting to pick up some fog there. It looks like to the north and even to the south and a few clouds down near uh, the uh, Nunavak Island area and off the southwest coast and definitely here along the north side of the Bearings or the uh, Alaska Peninsula with uh, rain uh, at times, light rain, fog over the Pribilof Islands, uh, but amounts light, kind of a weak trough sliding southeastward here, coming up and over the top of that ridge, but nothing significant, light winds and just uh, lots of clouds, patchy areas of fog. There is rain, uh, hasn't reached Shimia yet, associated with that front out there to the west. It looks like tonight it will, but wind's not a factor at all. I can only see one isobar out there, uh, and that's about it. Wind's uh, light here for the remainder of the Bering Sea, about the same pattern. Cloudy skies, patchy areas of low clouds, or patchy areas of fog with drizzle, again, from the Kerbaloff. Some of that might slip down into the eastern Aleutians, but nothing significant in the way of uh, accumulations. And then that also with this very weak feature here, extending from the thermal low, this uh, actually beginning to dissipate now, so the uh, showers, some of the moisture might get down to the Alaska Peninsula off the coast there. Thunderstorms diminishing this evening, may linger in the southwest here, 
and one might pop up around uh, or northwest of Denial Lake Park, and then diminishing showers over the Copper River Basin, along with diminishing clouds here over southern Alaska, including Kodiak Island, fair in the north, mostly clear, fog, low clouds possible on the eastern Arctic coast, and maybe an increase here over the Chukchi Sea to St. Lawrence Island. Pretty good moderate showers, probably you will uh, take hold over the northern southeast coast tonight, kind of uh, slipping south westward a little bit there, but the main system pulling off to the southeast, that weak low we had in the Gulf, that drops southeastward and really starts to wash out. But uh, So showers will be diminishing here across the southeast coast during the overnight hours tonight, as well as the southern interior. And then for tomorrow, sunny skies, uh, Kodiak Island, Kenai Peninsula, much of the north Gulf coast, all the way up to, say, the eastern Arctic coast, maybe some areas of low clouds and fog there, central coast as well. And then uh, Isolated thunderstorms at most widely scattered. They look to be pretty isolated. Uh, moisture supply really isn't there for any big thunderstorm development. But uh, Seward Peninsula looks good and anywhere along and just south of this trough axis, uh, northern Cuscombe Valley into the central interior and then to a lesser extent over the uh, upper Tanana Valley, 40 mile country and even the Copper River Basin looks like anything that pops there will be over near the Alaska Range. And you can see showers hanging on here uh, through tomorrow afternoon over, well, maybe the central southeast coast, but everything on a, a, drying, a drying trend coming in and clearing will start to increase as well. This week trough along the southwest coast uh, really isn't producing anything in the way of weather other than possibly a risk of a shower in Nunavak Island and along the Cuscombe Delta. Otherwise, just a few clouds with it down across the Alaska Peninsula. And uh, that front pushes just east of Shimia there. Uh, trying to uh, make some headway east over this uh, persistent ridge of high pressure we've had out over the Bering Sea. Uh, starting to weaken though, but that front is so washed out, it's probably not going to make it much farther. So we'll take a look at Thursday, and it just uh, kind of breaks into several troughs here coming up and over the ridge at the uh, top of this ridge centered just south of the central Aleutians. That's going to keep the pattern about the same as you've seen with uh, occasional areas of fog and drizzle with uh, mostly cloudy skies and a good chunk of IFR over the southern Bering and the Aleutians, looks like through Thursday, and uh, looks uh, warmer over the eastern interior. Highs uh, could be 80 to 85 uh, in the eastern interior. Either side of this trough axis are uh, looking mostly sunny, warm, 70s. It's the Sitna Valley, Kenai Peninsula, nice sunshine, north Gulf Coast, mostly sunny for the southeast coast. Taking a look at temperatures down that way, lows tonight, upper 40s to lower 50s. 50 to 55 here in the central interior, lower 30s on the Arctic coast with uh, 40s here everywhere else. Highs for tomorrow, 70s. Uh, could reach 70 again in Kotzebue, definitely for Ambler. Eastward here, lower to mid 70s uh, at least, maybe even some areas pushing 80. Hitting near 70 in the Susitna Valley, possibly 50s for the Panhandle, and then highs uh, or for lows following night. Uh, let me back one up. 40s for the southeast coast, 50 to 55 or so here in the central interior, and lower 30s for the Arctic coast, mid 40s south or Bristol Bay, and then the highs uh, again 70 to 80. Eastern interior could see maybe some lower 80s in some areas, Eagle, Chuck, Yitzik, and those locations and 70s, 75 to sit in the valley portion of the Kenai Peninsula, and 50s and 60s over the southeast coast, and 50s for the Alaska Peninsula. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. Moving on to the first flying weather graphic here uh, for a Wednesday morning. A lot of IFR, Southern Bering Sea, Aleutians, and then right up there into uh, uh, Bristol Bay here along the north side of the Alaska Peninsula with marginal VFR up over the Southwest Mountains and uh, then a little bit of VFR here south side of the uh, peninsula and then marginal for Kodiak, VFR the interior all the way out to except uh, maybe Point Barrow would be in the marginal zone out there up there and uh, some marginal VFR early on around the Wrangell Mountains and the southeast coast uh, marginal VFR with increasing VFR and you'll see into the afternoon, that practically goes all VFR for the southeast coast of offshore flow, especially a loft uh, northerly flow, uh, pushes the shower activity off to the south and southeast. Otherwise, IFR in the Gulf of Alaska, good VFR in the interior, marginal VFR central eastern Beaufort Sea coast, and the IFR here over the southern Bering and Aleutians continues, extending not quite as far 
uh, at least over the inland areas of Bristol Bay here, but staying out over the water. And then it looks like a little farther north here across of Herbalofs, marginal to St. Matthew Island, VFR and Inovac Island up to uh, the Chuck CC. And then for Thursday morning, stays VFR in the interior, increasing IFR out over the Bering Sea there, uh, edging its way northward. Now we've got marginal in over Nunavak Island, increase, big increase in the IFR here, Bristol Bay, Togiak Bay to Cape Newenham, also the Gulf of Alaska pushing in toward the uh, southeast coast here. And for the afternoon, Thursday afternoon, uh, improving a little bit here over the uh, inside water areas. Looks like staying pretty marginal down to the south. IFR continuing uh, northeast Pacific, Gulf of Alaska, VFR in the interior, a little bit of marginal VFR, Prince William Sound, up to maybe the Talkeetnas. And the uh, central eastern Beaufort Sea coast, uh, kind of uh, just right on the edge of the marginal VFR there. So that'd be right along the uh, coastline or offshore of the marine areas. Widespread IFR here in the Bering Sea, right up to the coastline. And uh, again, the north side of the Alaska Peninsula down into the Fox Islands. Passes for tomorrow, Anatuvik and Adigan, uh, both VFR. For those two areas, probably the entire Brooks Range VFR, Lake Clark and Merrill VFR, and Rainy VFR day flying coming up there, Windy VFR, Isabel, same forecast, VFR, and Mentasta, good VFR tomorrow, Tanita, same forecast, uh, VFR, possibly uh, ceilings, visibilities unlimited, possibly. Anyway, for Portage, VFR, and Chilkoot and White, turn out marginal VFR, uh, with the clouds and showers, but that'll uh, probably during the morning hours break out to VFR conditions as all that moisture slides off to the south and southeast and actually dissipates as it does. And for the freezing levels, not much of a gradient here, that uh, cold upper level trough finally pulling eastward into British Columbia yourself, some 4,000 foot uh, area there over the eastern southeast coast. And this is for uh, Wednesday morning. Otherwise, about 8,000 feet here over interior Alaska at the surface along the central eastern Arctic coast. And uh, really not much of a change out here over the Bering Sea until you get way off to the west and it edges up toward 10,000 feet. And for uh, icing, none expected over the Bering Sea or the uh, Aleutians, Alaska Peninsula, even over the interior from the Arctic coast on down to the Gulf. And then with that uh, showers left over, have areas of light mixed icing here, but that uh, whole area will be diminishing throughout the afternoon. And looking at the jet stream there, there's that upper level low that's uh, today currently sliding across the area, uh, actually crawling for the last several days, it actually kicks into uh, Western Canada. Now will be replaced by drier northerly flow for tomorrow. This jet staying down to the south and a week, that upper level low currently over the southwest, kicking the thunderstorms off today over the southwest part of the state. That's going to drift out, weaken there and be just off the coast. Otherwise, uh, not much of a flow out here. We've got some uh, westerlies that split by the time they reach the uh, western Aleutians, and that's uh, keeping the frontal boundaries out that way. 9,000 feet high pressure aloft here, Gulf of Alaska up into the interior. And a uh, couple of weak lows here, very light wind flow, 5 to 10 knots over the Aleutians, and uh, pretty light, maybe 15 over the Panhandle, 5 to 15 knot winds for the southeast coast, 3,000. Light and variable, just about no wind over interior Alaska, and uh, maybe 10 to 15 knots over the Aleutians, and that's about it wind-wise. And as a result, no significant turbulence expected anywhere in the state tomorrow. And after the break, I'll be back with the marine forecasts. Floating hundreds of miles from Earth, astronauts get a unique perspective of our planet. While they might recognize landmarks, space is the only place they can see the very edge of our planet's atmosphere. From orbit, particularly looking at the horizon, did bring to mind how thin the atmosphere is. It's like an onion skin around this great big ball of the Earth. This uppermost layer of Earth's atmosphere, the ionosphere, also overlaps with the very beginning of space. It's the job of NASA's new mission, GOLD, the Global Scale Observations of the Limon Disk Instrument, to study this region, a region that isn't just for astronauts to explore, but that affects humans every day down on the ground. For one thing, this layer of the upper atmosphere helps protect us from harmful radiation and energy emanating from the sun. But in our modern society, it does so much more. It affects the smartphone that sits in your pocket and the radio waves that guide our airplanes. 
The ionosphere is a crucial layer of the atmosphere through which our communications and GPS signals travel. And when this region changes, it impacts those communication signals. Changes can occur above this region from the sun's activity, also known as space weather. Changes can also occur below from Earth's weather, such as hurricanes and wind patterns. Gold connects the dots between how space weather and Earth's weather shape the upper reaches of the atmosphere. But this region isn't easy to study. The ionosphere spans roughly 60 to 400 miles from Earth's surface, which is too high for aircraft and scientific balloons, and the lower regions are too low to easily study with satellites. What are attainable, however, are the swaths of red and green light shining out from the upper atmosphere. Formed when the sun's rays hit atmospheric molecules, this light, named airglow, comes from green and red bands of glowing gas. Some of the airglow is invisible to our eyes, shining in infrared and ultraviolet light, which can only be seen with scientific instrumentation. Taking advantage of our planet's natural glow is gold. The gold instrument, which is about the size of a mini-fridge, is hitching a ride on a commercial communication satellite, SES-14. The satellite's orbit lies 22,000 miles above Earth, where it can record images in ultraviolet light to monitor changes in airglow across the globe. These images give information on the temperature, density and composition of particles in the upper atmosphere. Gold collects these observations faster than any mission has ever done before. It captures an image of Earth's entire disk every 30 minutes, allowing scientists to see how the upper atmosphere evolves throughout the day. Gold joins a host of missions studying the very nature of space around Earth, the Sun and planets. As NASA ventures farther and farther from home, knowing the nature of space itself is crucial for our journey to understand our solar system and beyond. There's a new class of chemical compounds impacting the Earth's ozone layer and raising concerns among some scientists. But a new NASA analysis indicates stratospheric ozone could actually be impacted more by climate change and the continued release of already banned chemicals. The Earth's ozone hole is showing signs of recovery, decades after the landmark agreement called the Montreal Protocol that banned many chemical compounds harmful to the ozone layer. So we know the Montreal Protocol was a huge success. This was signed in the late 1980s when scientists and policymakers from around the world gathered together to try to save the ozone layer. The chemicals they regulated persist in the atmosphere for many decades. They thin the ozone layer and they create a seasonal hole over Antarctica. They basically take away part of our planet's natural sunscreen and that increases the risk of skin cancer and damage to plants. Scientists have projected the ozone hole could disappear almost completely by about 2075, but several factors could delay that recovery. There are some industrial compounds that are not banned by the Montreal Protocol, but as they enter the atmosphere, they will also hurt the ozone layer. But the unregulated compounds have a short lifespan in the atmosphere, unlike the chlorofluorocarbons that were originally regulated. So they have a short-lived impact on ozone, and we don't think they'll delay recovery by more than a few years. We project that by 2050, more than half of the ozone-depleting compounds in the atmosphere will come from long-lived substances banned by the protocol. Because these compounds stay in the air for such a long time, compared to the unregulated, short-lived compounds, they will have a disproportionate and lingering impact on ozone. So any non-compliance with the protocol can have significant consequences. And the really big uncertainty in ozone layer recovery is climate change. There are many naturally produced ozone-depleting substances that are emitted by the oceans. And as the oceans continue to warm due to climate change, those emissions will increase and that will further delay ozone recovery. Scientists want to better understand how climate change will affect ozone recovery. This is a hard problem. As a scientific community, we need to work on this major issue. We now have a powerful new tool to simulate atmosphere and its interaction with land and ocean to study this issue. And that's what we're going to do.
how can you see the atmosphere? The answer is blowing in the wind. Tiny particles known as aerosols are carried by the air around the globe. This visualization uses data from NASA satellites combined with our knowledge of physics and meteorology to track three aerosols, dust, smoke, and sea salt. Sea salt, shown here in blue, is picked up by winds passing over the ocean. As tropical storms and hurricanes form, the salt particles are concentrated into the spiraling shape we all recognize. With their movements, we can follow the formation of Hurricane Irma and see the dust from the Sahara, shown in tan, get washed out of the storm center by the rain. Advances in computing speed allow scientists to include more details of these physical processes in their simulations of how the aerosols interact with the storm systems. The increased resolution of the computer simulation is apparent in fine details like the hurricane bands spiraling counterclockwise. Computer simulations let us see how different processes fit together and evolve as a system. By using mathematical models to represent nature, we can separate the system into component parts and better understand the underlying physics of each. Today's research improves next year's weather forecasting ability. Hurricane Ophelia was very unusual. It headed northeast, pulling in Saharan dust and smoke from wildfires in Portugal, carrying both to Ireland and the UK. This aerosol interaction was very different from other storms of the season. As computing speed continues to increase, scientists will be able to bring more scientific details into the simulations, giving us a deeper understanding of our home planet. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Welcome back to Day Sea Ice Analysis. Uh, not a little, not a lot of difference of any, very little, out here over the Chukchi Sea, and uh, maybe a little bit here. It looks like uh, maybe some southern advancement, uh, especially over in this area, what we had yesterday, and just maybe even less than that. So again, uh, not much change expected over the next uh, four or five days. Everything will just kind of oscillate around uh, with respect to whichever way the wind's blowing and the currents. For the uh, coastal water forecast, northwest winds 15 on the south coast, otherwise 20 for uh, the central coast, north coast, north side there, west at 15. Lynn Canal, south winds 15 knots tomorrow, northwest at 10 for Stevens Passage and Clarence Strait, and then the outlook for the following day on Wednesday, northwest winds, central, southern, inside waters, 10 to 15, 5 to 15 knots, these 2 to 3 feet. South winds over Lynn Canal, 20 knots, northwest 20 on the south coast. And then uh, diminishing here and turning westerly by the time you get to the north coast, down to 10 knots with 4 foot seas. Prince William Sound, west winds at 10, seas slight, west 20 for the eastern north Gulf Coast, 7 foot seas. West side here, uh, Barren Islands up into the western North Gulf Coast, uh, 15 knots out of the southwest, southwest 10, Kamishak Bay, south to southwest at 10 for Cook Inlet. And the next day for Thursday, <laughs> west winds at 20 knots here for Cook Inlet, southeast 15 there for Kamishak Bay, same thing for the Barren Islands, west winds, light west winds, 10 knots for the North Gulf Coast, same thing for Prince William Sound. Kodiak Island, uh, west winds there, also there on the eastern zones at 10 knots, Chillicoff Strait, southwest 15. Then we got 10 knot winds, Sitkanak to Castle Cape, 15 knot winds, Castle Cape to Sitkanak. Bering Sea side of the peninsula, southwest at 20, and that's about the windiest place you'll have in, these, in the, this set of marine zones, otherwise Bristol Bay at 15 knots. And those go light, uh, 10 knots there, Bristol Bay out of the northwest all the way down to Cape Sarachev, south side of the peninsula, 10 knots. But from Castle Cape to Sitkanak, pick it up about 20 knots out of the east. Southeast 15 there for the east side of Kodiak, variable to northwest at 10 for Shelikoff Strait. For the Fox Islands tomorrow, westerlies 10 to 15 knots, seas 3 to 4 feet, and light winds continue. Eight Akanaka out of the west at 10, and that extends back to about uh, Kiska. Then in response to that very weak front, we've got uh, 15 knots southerly winds, 7-foot seas in advance of that feature. 
And then those uh, turn northwest at 10 here, so back, or staying in the light wind pattern here, all of the Aleutians, uh, northwesterlies to Atka at 10 knots, sees uh, three to five feet, and that's about it. And then kind of a variable wind pattern here for the uh, Fox Islands, 10 knots or 10 to 15 knots. On Alaska Island, though, probably predominantly northwest. And for the southwest coast, west northwesterlies, 15 knots, 10 knot winds for uh, St. Lawrence Island, and Norton Sound, but reverse the directions between the two, and 15 out of the west there for St. Matthew Island, light winds for the Pribilofs. Light winds continue, northwest 10 for St. Paul, St. George Island, St. Matthew Island, west 15, light westerly winds here along the coast at 10 knots, really light winds south at 5 there for St. Lawrence Island and Norton Sound. Eastern Boulevard Sea Coast, light northeast winds tomorrow at 10 knots, sees uh, 2 feet at the most, or 2 feet give or take and east 15 for the central coast, northeast 15 all the way down the west side there to Cape Thompson and then northeast 10 knots on down to Wales. Next day, light variable winds here from Wales all the way up to Cape Beaufort, then northeast to 10, western Arctic coast, east 15 uh, for the central and part of the eastern stretch here and then up to 20 knots out of the east uh, for the far eastern zone. For tonight, uh, look for maybe an increase in uh, low clouds or fog again. That fog went right off the coast we saw earlier in the satellite. Otherwise, mostly clear here in the interior, diminishing uh, showers and thunderstorms, especially here in the southwest. Some could linger up along the uh, Alaska Range or northern Cuscombe Valley, otherwise diminishing showers southeast part of the state. Uh, no change here in the Bering Sea. Wind's not a factor at all. And some moderate showers could uh, develop over the northern pan and otherwise look for conditions to decrease here to the south. That will continue through tomorrow, but some of those showers will be lingering and drifting southward. And you'll see clearing coming in from the north. Isolated thunderstorms along and south of this trough axis. Otherwise, temperatures in the 70s and lower 80s over much of interior Alaska. And then the outlook for Thursday. Uh, warmer, again, could see 80 to 85 eastern interior with uh, thunderstorms isolated, triggered along that trough axis through the central interior, sunny and mild to the south, and sunny for the panhandle. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbormaster before you go boating.